lots of buddies and buddy girls. I hope you're having a great week. And today we are going to be finishing off chapter two of Welcome to the Universe. This is part two. If you enjoy this video and um, aren't already subscribed, I hope you will do so. Leave a comment, hit the like button, and yeah, I would appreciate it. Let's get started. Social anthropologists say that state lotteries are a tax on the poor. Not really. It's a tax on all those people who didn't learn about mathematics. Because if they did learn, they would understand that the probabilities are against them, and they wouldn't spend a dime of their hard-earned money. Buying lottery tickets. Education is what this book is all about. A plus, or plus a dose of cosmic enlightenment. Let's discuss the moon. And then get straight to Johannes Kepler. And then to my man Isaac Newton, whose home I visited when filming Cosmos, a space-time odyssey. But first... We've got Earth going around the sun, and of course, we have the moon going around Earth. And now they are showing another figure, which we can't show. We put the sun way off in the distance to the right, and Earth in the center of the diagram. And we show the moon at different positions as it circles Earth. We are looking down on the north pole of the moon's orbit. As sunlight comes in from the right, both Earth and the moon are always at all times half illuminated by the sun. If you're standing on Earth, looking at the moon, when it is opposite the sun, what do you see? What phase is the moon? Full. in figure 2.3, which we can't see, show the appearance of the moon as seen from Earth at each point in its orbit. Why don't we have a lunar eclipse every month when Earth is between the sun and moon like this? It is because the moon's orbit is tipped at about 5 degrees relative to Earth's orbit around the sun. So, in most months, the moon passes north or south of Earth's shadow in space, preserving our normal view of the full moon. Once in a while, when the moon is full as it crosses the plane of Earth's orbit, it will pass into Earth's shadow, and we have lunar eclipse. Now let the moon continue 90 degrees counterclockwise in its orbit. The moon is now in third quarter phase. This is known as half moon. You see the moon half illuminated. Bring the moon 90 degrees further along, counterclockwise, in its orbit, and the moon passes between Earth and the sun. Only the side of the moon facing the sun is lit up, and you can't see that. So when standing on Earth, you can't see the moon at all. We call it New Moon. The moon usually passes north or south of the sun during this phase. Occasionally, when it passes directly in front of the sun, we get a solar eclipse. So far, 
we have full moon, third quarter moon, and new moon come around another 90 degrees, and we get first quarter moon when it is half illuminated again. We also have in-between phases, crossing from new moon to first quarter moon. What do you see? Only a little smidgen, a crescent. It's called a waxing crescent moon, because it grows thicker every day. And just before new moon, we get a waning crescent. This crest, These crescents face opposite directions as the moon shrinks and then grows again. Between first quarter and full moon, we have something called waxing gibbous. It's a pretty awkward looking phase and is almost never drawn by artists, even though half the time we ever see the moon, it's in a, fa in a gibbous phase, not quite full, not quite quarter moon. If artists were drawing the sky randomly throughout the year, we might expect to see a gibbous moon half the time in their work, yet they typically choose to draw either a crescent moon or a full moon. They are not capturing the full reality that lay in front of them. Of course, this entire cycle takes a month, formerly known as a month. If the full month moon is opposite the sun, what time of day does it rise? It is opposite the sun, and the sun is setting. Then we conclude the full moon is rising at sunset. And if the sun is rising, the full moon is setting. The situation is different at other times of the month. When the third quarter moon is high in the sky, the sun is rising. Notice in the diagram where Earth is rotating counterclockwise. You are getting rotated into sunlight when the third quarter moon is high in the sky. Imagine taking your brain and your eyes into that picture, looking around and then stop or stepping back in the real world to check your result. I have an app on my computer such that every time I bring up the desktop, the moon is there showing its phase day by day. That's my lunar clock. It connects me to the universe, even when I'm staring at my computer screen. Let's get back to the solar system. Mid to late 1500s, in Denmark, there lived a wealthy astronomer named Tycho Bra, or Tycho, not sure. The crater Tycho on the moon is named after him. I spent an hour once with someone who was native to Denmark, learning how to pronounce this astronomer's name correctly. Tikabra, I guess. Tikabra. Oh, okay. It's, I see. I think it's Tikabra. <laughs> I worked hard on that. But of course, in America, we pronounce it however it looks to us. Tikabra carried a lot about the planets enough to keep track of them. He built the best naked eye instrument of the day, maintaining the most accurate measurements of planetary positions ever. Telescopes were not invented until 1608. So, Tycho used sighting instruments while writing down the positions of stars on the sky and of the planets as a function of time. Tycho had enormous database and a brilliant assistant. The German mathematician Johannes Kepler. Kepler took the data and he figured stuff out. Kepler said to himself, I understand what the planets are doing. In fact, I can create laws that describe exactly what the planets are doing. Before Kepler, the organization of the universe was plain and obvious. Look, 
the stars revolve around us, the sun rises and sets, the moon rises and sets, we must be at the center of the universe. This not only felt good to believe, it also looked that way. It stoked the human ego, and the evidence supported it, so no one doubted. Until the Polish astronomer Nikolaus Copernicus came along. If Earth were in the middle, what are the planets doing? You look up, and from day to day you watch Mars move against the background stars. Mm, right, now it's slowing down. Oh wait, it stopped now. It's going backward. That's called retrograde motion. Then it's going forward again. Why should it do that? Copernicus wondered if the sun were in the middle and Earth went around the sun. What then? Well, these forward and backward motions get explained in a snap. The sun is in the middle. Earth goes around the sun in an orbit like a race car going around a racetrack. Mars, the next planet out from the sun, orbits more slowly, like a slower race car, in an outer line. When Earth passes Mars on the inside track, Mars seems to be going backward in the sky for a while. If you are in the fast lane on the highway and pass a slower car in the next lane, that car appears to drift backward relative to you. If you put the sun in the middle and made Earth and Mars go around the sun in simple circular orbits, it explained the retrograde motion. It explained what was going on in the nighttime sky. Planets farther from the sun orbited more slowly. Copernicus published all this in a tome called De, Re De Revolution Nibis Orbium Colestium. If you try to buy the first edition of that book at auction, it will cost you over two million dollars, as it is one of the most important books ever written in human history. It was published in 1543, and it got people thinking. Copernicus had been afraid to publish the book at first. It had been showing his manuscript to colleagues privately. You couldn't just start saying to everyone that Earth was no longer in the center of the universe. The powerful Catholic Church had other ideas about things, asserting that Earth was in the center. Aristotle had said so. In ancient Greece, Aristocar Aristocar uh, Aristocus had correctly deduced that Earth orbited the sun, but Aristotle's view won out and the church still subscribed to it, since it was consistent with scripture. So, when did Copernicus publish this, his book? When he lay on his deathbed. You can't be persecuted when you're dead. He reintroduced the sun-centered universe called heliocentric model. Helio means sun. Before then, we had geocentric model that came from Aristotle, Ptolemy, and later, by decree, the Church. And then came Kepler, Kepler who agreed with Copernicus up to a point. Copernicus invoked orbits that were perfect circles, but because these didn't quite match the observed motions of the planets, Copernicus had adjusted them by adding smaller epic cycle circles as Ptolemy had done as well. Still, they didn't exactly match the positions of the planets in the sky. Kepler figure, figured that the Copernican model needed fixing, and from the data planetary position measurements over time left to him by Tycho Brahe, he deduced three laws of planetary motion. We call them Kepler's laws. The first one says... Planets orbit in ellipses, not circles. What's an ellipse? Mathematically, a circle has one center, and an ellipse sort of has two centers. We call them... Um, I think this word has a few different ways to pronounce it, so I'm just going to say foci. 
some people say foci, I think, or foci. In a circle, all points are equidis equidistant from the center, whereas in an, in an ellipse, all points have the same sum of distances to the two foci. In fact, a circle is the limiting case of an ellipse in which the two foci occupy the same spot. An elongated ellipse has foci that are far apart. As I bring the foci together, I get something that more closely resembles a perfect circle. According to Kepler, planets orbit in ellipses with the sun at one focus. This is already revolutionary. The Greeks said, if the universe is divine, it must have been, it must be perfect. And they had a ph philosophical sense of what being perfect meant. A circle is a perfect shape. Every point on a circle is the same distance from its center. That's perfection. Any movement in the divine universe must trace perfect circles. Stars move in circles, they thought. This philosophy had endure, endured for thousands of years. Then, here comes Kepler saying, No, people, they are not circles. I've got the data left to me by Tycho to show their ellipses. He further showed that as planets orbit, the speed of a planet varies with its distance from the sun. Imagine an orbit that is a perfect circle. There's no reason for the speed to be any different on one part of the circle than another. The planet should just keep the same speed, but not so with the ellipse. Where would the planets have the most speed? As you might suspect, when the planet is closest to the sun. Kepler found that a planet travels fast when it is close to the sun and more slowly when it is further away. Thinking about the problem geometrically, Kepler said, let's measure how far the planet goes. For an example, in a month, when it is close to the sun and moving fast in a month, it will sweep out a certain area of its orbit in a stubby fat fan. Call this area A1. Let's do the same experiment in another part of the orbit, when it is farther away from the sun. Kepler observed that it is moving more slowly when it is farther away, and therefore it's not going to travel as far in the same amount of time. As it travels a shorter distance, it will trace out a th long, thin, fan-shaped area. In the same one-month period, Kepler was clever enough to notice that the area is swept out in a month was the same whether it was close or far. In a month, what? Uh, sorry, I got a call and it like interrupted the... Kepler was clever enough to notice that the area it swept out in a month was the same whether it was close or far from the sun. He therefore made a second law. Planets sweep out equal areas in equal times. just looking to see how much is left. I think I'm going to end right there because I actually have uh, like a sore throat, so it's kind of uh, hurting to whisper like this. So yeah, I'm sorry if this is not that long and I promised that I was going to finish this chapter, but it's actually hurting my throat more than I thought it would, so um, anyways, I will see you on Friday. Hopefully my throat's feeling better. Um, and I will, I hope you are, uh, have a good rest of the week.